Hi, I'm Jeff Garrett. I'm Dean of the Wharton School and I'm welcoming you all to this very special day. Welcome to our faculty and staff, our family and friends, parents and partners, but above all, welcome to the 2020 graduates of the Wharton School. We're living in unprecedented times. Indeed, I think they're unimaginable times. They're full of uncertainty, challenges, and anxieties. But amid all of our concerns, I think it's really important to remember two things. First, this is a great day of celebration, celebrating the massive achievement of our graduates and giving profound thanks to all the people who've made it possible and above all, their families. But the second thing I want you to remember is that the world needs you, our graduates, not only to help us get through the crisis, but also to chart the course to a better future for us all. Many of you have heard me use the phrase more than ever Wharton. And I use it because I think it's true. I think it's true of everything about the Wharton School and it's true about every one of you. The world needs you more than ever. You have my heartfelt congratulations for everything you've done and my deep gratitude for all you're doing and all you will do. Along with all of you, I so wish we were physically together today. There's nothing like the energy, the excitement, and above all, the love of a Wharton graduation ceremony. But today's unique. For most of you, this is your first graduation from Wharton, the world's first and I believe the world's best business school. This is certainly, however, a first, the first ever graduation of this great school not held in person, and I know we all hope it's the last. But this is also my last graduation as Wharton Dean, and that fills me with real sadness, but also great joy. It's been the greatest privilege of my professional career to be Dean of the school because of just what an amazing institution Wharton is. But it's also been my greatest pleasure because of all the incredible people who make up that Wharton institution. And that's not least our students. Now, neither you nor I could ever have imagined that our time at Wharton would end this way, even a few months ago. But here we are, making the best of things, making the most of everything we do. And after all, that is the Wharton way. The crisis has tested us all, not only as individuals, but also as leaders. And you're all leaders. And I'm so proud of everything you're doing to lead in these challenging times. You're leading in academic discussions, both inside and outside our now virtual classrooms. You're leading by connecting with your classmates who are scattered all around the world. And you're leading in your communities, not only at Wharton and Penn, but throughout your lives. I've been thinking a lot about what leadership means in these times, and I'm thinking about it as leading in uncertain times. And my number one reaction is to believe that we don't need any more the kind of heroic leaders who say, trust me, I know the way, follow me. And the reason that's not going to work today is that none of us knows what's actually going to happen in the future. We all need others. So I have three suggestions about leadership, and they're all about bringing out the best in others. And of course, that is the core of leadership. So suggestion one, be humble. You know, we're all smart people, and I know we work really hard, but none of us has all the answers. So I think leaders need to say that to everyone who works with and for them. I think I'm pretty smart, I know I work hard, but I don't have the answers and I need your help. Humility is a powerful human virtue. I think it's an incredibly important part of leadership. Second, be open. And by that, I don't only mean that we should be transparent and authentic, although those things are incredibly important. We don't want leaders who seem photoshopped to focus group everything. We want open leaders. But there's a second challenge of openness in leadership right now that I would call explainer in chief. The world is a dizzyingly complex place. What we need is leaders who can unpack complexity and do so in a way that presents simple realities without being simplistic and without talking down to anybody. Explainer in chief we need, but it's really hard to achieve. My third leadership principle would be 
be committed. And by that, I'm, I'm really thinking about the profound difference between younger generations today, Gen Z, millennials, and older people. Younger people, including all of you, our graduates, are just more mission-driven and purpose-oriented than anybody before. And you expect and demand of your leaders that we're the same way. You can't have a disconnect between leaders and the people who work with them. It's just not going to get us to where we need to go. So be humble, be open, be committed. Now, two pieces of advice for everyone, uh, thinking about us now, not just as leaders, but as human beings. The first one is just mindset. And you know, I think I'm an optimist by nature, but I know that we can't be naive optimists. We can't bury our head in the sands or have our eyes looking to the sky. We need to be realistic in our optimism. So optimism is a, is a force of life. It keeps us moving, but we need to make sure that our optimism is, optimism is realistic. Second thing is, you know, we, we think a lot about focusing on our passions and doing things for the right reasons because we want to do them, and I endorse that 100%. But I think that that kind of personal focus is just more powerful and more meaningful if we think about others at the same time. And here the two big words for me are empathy and compassion. You know, make sure that you can try always to see things from another person's perspective, to walk in their shoes. That's empathy. And then compassion. Passion is saying, if you can do something to improve the lot of other people, you should do it. So I think we all should be optimists, but let's be realistic. And of course, we should focus on our passions, but let's have lots of empathy and compassion to go along with it. Now, I can tell you that right now, my primary goal is to leave the Wharton School in the best possible shape for our incoming Dean, Erica James. And I, I want to let you know that the Dean transition is in full swing. I've spent many hours one on one with Erica and now uh, additional hours in, in team meetings with her. Um, I know the school is in great hands with Erica James, and I also know that the world is going to need Wharton going forward. The world needs Wharton because we need two things, I think. The first one is creative thinking about extraordinary challenges, out-of-the-box thinking, do things differently. Wharton's great at that. But we also need the core skill of a rigorous business school like Wharton, and I would call that the skill which is the discipline of turning ideas into outcomes, outcomes that are going to matter, outcomes that are going to make the world a better place. I know that's why you came to Wharton, and it's why I've enjoyed so much watching you grow and flourish in your time at the school. And it's why I can't wait to see what you're gonna do now that you're leaving. So on behalf of the entire school, I wanna send you hearty and sincere congratulations. Congratulations to our 2020 graduates. Good afternoon, class of 2020. Who would have thought that you would be observing your graduation today from all points on the globe. Instead of being together on campus, decked out in your robes and mortarboards, surrounded by family and friends. This is truly a historic moment, although not in the typical sense. Your graduation is taking place against the backdrop of cataclysmic disruption that is impacting the population of the entire planet. I know that the pandemic has had significant effects on your lives. There were great challenges for you during this last term. Geographic dislocation, health concerns, economic hardships, canceled study and travel opportunities, and of course, missed special events that meant so much to your class. Community can be reconfigured through technology, but only to a certain extent. The physical part, study groups huddling together on a project, sharing a meal at a friend's home, a comforting hug and the camaraderie in a crowd of cheering classmates celebrating competitions, performances, storytelling, and of course, graduation. These cannot be duplicated through a screen. And yet, despite these difficulties and disappointments, you persevered and you made it to the finish line. In addition to sending you congratulations and my appreciation, for your fortitude and flexibility in this last daunting term, I'd like to offer you a challenge. How will you take what you've learned at Wharton 
to become a rebuilder in the uncharted economy ahead. With the extraordinary benefits you've enjoyed as a Wharton student, training by top academics, and surrounded by accomplished peers, what is your responsibility to help lead and heal the wounded world that you will enter after graduation? A world where people from all walks of life have suffered devastating losses of loved ones, jobs, healthcare, housing, and the ability to provide for their families. This question was recently posed to me by several students who have been reflecting on this aspect of their careers after Wharton. One student, Jamie Joseph, summed it up like this. How will we, as industry leaders, focus not only on profits and revenues, but also the welfare of our workers? Can we lead with compassion and courage while making the difficult decisions needed to rebuild organizations and economies. There is a Hebrew expression, tikkun olam, that means acting constructively and beneficially to repair the world. I hope that you will consider making this your responsibility as the next generation of thought leaders and decision makers. As the Dalai Lama has observed on leadership, a commitment to the oneness of humanity and altruism is fundamental for societies and organizations and their individuals to thrive in the long run. Every one of us has a responsibility to make this happen. I look forward to celebrating with you in person when we can all safely be reunited to mark your graduation. In the meantime, congratulations and best of luck in the next chapter of your life. Let me take a moment now to draw your attention to the online MBA Class of 2020 Celebration Booklet. There you will find listed the Palmer Scholars for the Class of 2020. These students consistently performed at the highest level with an academic performance that placed them in the top 5% of the class. We congratulate these students on their outstanding achievement. Each year, academic departments and the second year class recognize students who have excelled in the classroom and those who have made an impact on the community during their two years at Wharton. You will also find these listed in the online booklet. Our congratulations to all of these award recipients. And now it is my honor to introduce our student speaker, Sheda Bautista Sayan. Before coming to Wharton, Sheda spent four years at Gartner a research and advisory firm in Washington, D.C., where she helped establish the first diversity resource group at the firm. At Wharton, she has been involved in our community as a student life fellow and an admissions fellow in the healthcare management program. A primary focus of Shada's engagement has been to build community and bring people together through active membership in several affinity clubs, participation in prospective student events, and the creation of spaces for first and second years to interact. After graduation, Shada will be moving to Los Angeles to work for DaVita, helping to increase access to at-home dialysis. Here's Shada. Hi, everyone. My name is Shada, and I am a proud member of the Wharton MBA class of 2020. Thanks for tuning in from your couches, your kitchens, maybe you're on a walk. I'm here in my living room and you can't see it, but my four crazy roommates are right behind this camera cheering me on as I take on this ambitious risk to be your graduation speaker. I never thought of myself as someone who embraced risks, but after coming to Wharton, I've learned to appreciate life's challenges. I've learned that I do take risks, big and small, head on. We all do. We all took the risk of coming to business school, taking time out of the workforce. Would the debt be worth it? Would we make those lifelong friends? We took a huge leap, but it was absolutely a risk worth taking. Looking back at my growth over the past two years, I think about this time I let my friends convince me I should jump off these 10 foot cliffs 
into these huge bodies of water in the Philippines. I'm terrified of swimming. Yet they were always right in front of me, cheering me on when I had the courage to jump. With life jackets, of course. I think about that time I took corporate finance as a second year, alongside all those first year banking and finance experts. I was so lost and confused so much of the time. I remember so vividly one day I wanted to ask a question and everything in my stomach told me not to do it. But a small risk, but a risk nonetheless. I raised my hand really timidly, halfway. Maybe the professor didn't see me. And to probably nobody's surprise, the world didn't end, but it was scary. But the more and more I forced myself to ask those questions, the more and more I became comfortable with being nervous. When my mom was 18, she had to risk her entire life because she thought she would have a better one in the US. It was 1979 and in her home country of Iran, there was a revolution. She could no longer dress how she wanted to or study what she wanted to in school. And once her and her family realized that they would never return back to a state of normalcy or back to a place they once called home, they packed up their things and started a new life in America. My mom had to learn new skills and raise a family in an unfamiliar place. She had to lose some of her culture to assimilate, but seeing where my brother and I ended up, it was a risk worth taking. Unfortunately, she passed away unexpectedly two days before I was set to start college. Now I was 18 years old and was facing the biggest risk of my life yet. I had to make a decision. Do I defer my first year of college, stay home with my family and seek comfort in my bed? Or do I take the risk of starting a new chapter? Of starting school not knowing what the future would look like? Risking breaking down in tears when I made new friends at a welcome mixer? Risking no longer feeling that sense of security if I failed? Well, I learned from my mom that these challenges are worth overcoming. And because of her, I pushed forward and I started school not knowing where I would land. I used to think risks were scary and overwhelming. But at Wharton, risks became exciting and I found myself over the two years looking for ways to stretch myself. I'm only one story and I'm consistently impressed and inspired by the risks our classmates take. Thank you to all those brave speakers who shared their deeply personal stories and storytellers. To my more creative classmates who are risking it all to pursue their own dreams and companies. I think about the partners who had their own risks and challenges to support their families and to the international students who had to make a new city their home and had to figure out why Americans love Philly cheesesteaks. I'm with you on that one. Now is the time we get to take the greatest risks of all. Why? Because not only are we, like all of the graduates who have come before us, trying to make a name for ourselves and a living for our family, not only are we trying to create innovative solutions to the world's existing problems, not only has this crisis exposed the incredible inequalities that ex exist in our society, but now, now we're being asked to lead in this unprecedented uncertainty. We are the managers, the CEOs, founders, professors and community leaders who will motivate our colleagues and our friends to show up to work every day, inspire them to keep moving forward and lift this mood that's permeating our lives these days. Sure, it's daunting. I'm scared. But we have what it takes. Our two years have made sure of that. We've pushed through physical and mental limits, through ventures and team projects, through joining D-League sports teams. We learned how to give believable answers in class when we were entirely unprepared and then cold called on. Most importantly, we learned how to lead authentically from each other, from our professors, and administrators and from ourselves. 
we have what it takes to take this next step. And somehow it's already time for us to graduate. Sure, we don't get that in-person ceremony or that warm congratulatory hug from our favorite professors, but we've already learned how to bond, show support, and make new memories in this Zoom and blue jeans era. But what we've learned in both the classroom and over the past few months, we are a class that has been tried time and time again, and each time have overcome these challenges head on. The grit, empathy, and confidence we have built as a community sure do represent leadership. I define a leader as someone who can act when things aren't clear, when a path isn't set, that time is now more than ever. So, go be the leaders that you were made to be and the leaders we deserve. <laughs> Thank you. I'll see you guys soon. Thank you, Shada, for sharing your personal story with us and reminding us of the importance of taking risks. Now, for the next part of our ceremony, I had to don the appropriate regalia. No, not my academic robes, but something really special. So join me now. We've created a video which is a look back on your experience at work. Enjoy. When I first got to Wharton two years ago, I had no idea what this experience would bring. I mean, I didn't expect how much we would laugh together, how much we would dance together, how much we would listen to each other, how much we would lift each other up, and especially right now, how much we would step up for each other. We have become smarter, stronger, bolder, more caring, more empathetic, more capable leaders now than we were two years ago. The Wharton experience has transformed me into a more compassionate leader. I've always been someone who is go, go, go on everything, but coming to Wharton actually made me take a pause and explore my own identity and passions. Wharton showed me who I can be. Uh, and that's not just Wharton, the institution, the classes, and what I can do. That's mostly from the people that I get to spend time with, the connections that I made, the students that I've met. I'm so thankful for these relationships, and I can point to every single person I've met here, and there's a lesson learned there. There's something that I want to take away. There's some part of them that I want to work on and develop and be better at myself. The most transformative experience at Wharton has definitely been the people. My peers are trustworthy, loyal, cheerful, and dedicated to making sure this experience on a day-to-day -day basis is the best it can be. Having an opportunity to travel to a country that you know, is halfway across the world, you really got a chance to see and really open your eyes in terms of life um, for people who don't look like you um, and come from different backgrounds. I think that this is the reason why you come to Wharton, to learn from people with completely different backgrounds from you in such a personal and intimate way, visit their homes and be able to take this information and new perspective into your world beyond. I'm so fond of becoming an SLF and being back on campus over the summer for preterm, getting to welcome all the first years, just the excitement, um, the bewilderment in their eyes as they try to figure out what they've gotten themselves into, what lies ahead of them, um, being able to share that moment with them, being able to be a compass in some regard that they're trying to figure that out. Congratulations, class of 2020. Congratulations, class of 2020. Class of 2020, congratulations. Congratulations, class of 2020. Congratulations, class of 2020. What an amazing accomplishment, and it's been an honor to be with you for two years. 
Congratulations, class of 2020. Congratulations, class of 2020. As we move to close our celebration, let me ask the members of the MBA class of 2020 to help me with an essential part of today's festivities. Please take time to thank the people who have helped you along your MBA journey, family, spouses, friends, colleagues, mentors, those people who supported you from the moment you decided to return to school throughout these two years to where you are today. And on behalf of my MBA program colleagues, I would like to thank each of you, the members of the class of 2020, for all that you have done to make Wharton a stronger community and program. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's final speaker, Sam Lundquist, Vice Dean for External Affairs. Congratulations, Wharton Class of 2020. I'm Sam Lundquist, Vice Dean of External Affairs at the Wharton School. Today is the first day of the rest of your life as Wharton alumni. And the External Affairs team works hard to keep you connected to the school. We do it by keeping the global Wharton network alive and strong for you. It's 100,000 alumni in 153 different countries around the world. And we have 76 alumni clubs ready to serve you no matter where you go after graduation. This is why you chose Wharton. The alumni community is more important than ever before. So please engage. The Wharton brand is now part of your personal brand. So use it well. Congratulations and see you in Philadelphia as soon as possible.